if you are losing weight, it is an energy deficit. It's, it's right. everyone is subject to the laws of thermodynamics, just like gravity. That's just the reality. Work requires energy. What proportion of the work you do comes from your food? What proportion is gonna come from body fat? If there's not enough food coming into the system to provide to uh, energy for your activity, your body will tap into your reserves, i.e. body fat, and force it in your bloodstream to be used for energy, and you will lose it. And everyone is subject to it. And if people tell me they're not, I always use the extreme example. I say, what would happen if you didn't eat for a month? They say, oh, I'd lose weight. Okay, so clearly, it matters, you know? <laughs> I mean, that's an extreme example, but it's just to make the point, and I, and I say that not to be a jerk. I say it because I'm telling you that you can do it. You are not cursed. If you're doing this thing that, oh, it's my metabolism. If you're heavier, you burn more calories than your leaner friends. That's how it works. John Brooks, it's great to have you here today. Thanks for having me again. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. I know the last time we talked was the podcast on uh, how to get ripped in your 40s. Thank you for that. I got a lot of positive feedback on that. Today, I want to get into what people can do now that we are about two years into the what I'm calling the COVID shit show. <laughs> it's just a crazy time and and I've seen a lot of my peers and just a lot of people in general adopt non-healthy habits, whether that's eating comfort food, that is just watching the news and then focusing on the wrong things sometimes. And one of the um, one of the stats that really jumped out to me, or, or I should say one of the things I heard is this quarantine 15. And that is, to me, very synonymous with when I was a freshman in college, and they call it the freshman 15, where you don't even realize it, but you gain weight because you kind of stop being as active as you were in maybe high school, and then you're eating worse. And I think this is happening a lot in COVID. And one of the stats that was pretty interesting from the American Psychological Association was um, 42% of U.S. adults reported undesired weight gain with an average gain of 29 pounds. And this was a study done in February of 2021. So my question to you to kick this off is, many people have found themselves in this rut or this predicament, and they haven't worked out or they haven't adopted like a healthy eating plan in two years. Where does someone begin to start? Yeah, it's a great question, and, and I can confirm that anecdotally. I've had, my business has exploded with people who have had these um, same issues with COVID, right? Um, so where I like to start with people, in, especially in the, you know, this scenario here, is take inventory of you know, your barriers, right? Like what's preventing you from making change right now? And be honest with yourself. You, know, you can write it down. You know, for a lot of people, they're going to say it's time. You know, for others, it's going to be things like, you know, I'm, I'm at home a lot and I'm bored, right? Which, which would then lead to step two, right? Like analyze your food environment. What do you have around you? So if you find yourself working from home more because of COVID, well, you need to make better decisions in so far as the type of food that you keep in your house. So don't tempt it, right? Make it, make it easier on yourself. Set yourself up for um, success. So th those would be the first two steps. Um, you know, and then, you know, then step three is analyze your social support. Like who, who's around you? Are they supporting your decisions or, or maybe you're married and, you know, you can go to your spouse and say, Hey, let, maybe, let's do this together. Let's start making some, you know, positive changes. Right. So that, that would be kind of a, a big picture thing. And then, you know, lastly would be, be honest with yourself in so far as, you know, why do I want to change? Right. Like we, we all, that, it's not a secret that it's not healthy to be overweight like that. Right. I think most people understand that, but if you truly prioritize something and you truly understand of how detrimental that can be in the longer term, you could really start to make that change. So once you've done those, then, you know, we can get into more concrete steps, which I'm, you know, I'm sure we can probably jump into, you know, throughout, but that would be where I would start is right there. Just take inventory of the problem and, and work from there. Yeah. One of the things you said, I think is so key and that is the social support. And if you don't have that at home, it's okay. I think, what I've seen help is you need to start to do things that motivate you, not distract you. 
or not give you a reason to not do it. And that would, an example of that, like I was, uh, I was talking about a, a minute ago, is like the news. So if you wake up in the morning, your pattern is to turn on the news. Is the news positive or negative most of the time? Sure. It's a rhetorical question. It's usually negative. So now you're starting your day with this, these negative emotions. You're not going to be motivated to get up and exercise or work out and start a, a journey back to health and wellness. I just don't, I, you can do it, but it's going to sure. be harder versus finding, if you're going to be on Instagram or social scrolling, finding people that inspire you. And I think that is so key. You're spot on. I always, you know, I, I, I use a lot of quotes and, you know, when you're, you know, maybe when you're younger, you kind of roll your eyes at them, but, you know, then they start to come true and you're like, oh, wow, that's true. So like one of my favorites is, you know, if you want to soar with the eagles, you can't hang with the crows, right? Um, and, and that doesn't mean, oh, get rid of all your friends and people around you, because sometimes you could be the eagle that uplifts other people, right? That's certainly part of it. Um, but like you mentioned, since something as simple as social media and surrounding yourself with positive messages and you know, you'll have those aha moments and moments. And before you know it, the, the more you're around those, like, you know, listening to your podcast, for instance, you have a lot of, you know, I use it to, I send people, you know, you had Rich Roll and I was sending that to clients and they're writing by, oh, this is great. You know, cause you know, he does a great job, for instance, of um, really driving home the point that, you know, people can change. Right. And I truly believe that. And just some people are really good at articulating that. And I think he's very good at that. And sometimes with my job, is, you know, I teach people the science and nutrition. That, that's pretty easy, and I, and I can teach people that, right, and clear up those myths. But really where the, the real change happens is from the behavioral and psychological, and starting from that standpoint, like you said, surround yourself with positive things, and then understand that, yes, you can change. Don't pigeonhole yourself. Don't see yourself as what you currently are. You know, so if you've been heavy your whole life, I'm here to tell you, I've had people like that that have identified themselves. Oh, I'm the fat kid, or I'm the fat girl, I'm the fat guy. And, you know, people deal with it differently. Sometimes they self-deprecate, what have you. But you need to start visualizing, visualizing yourself as not that. And, and, and then it can start to become true. So I think that's really important. That's a good point. Yeah, and I would say if, if you're going to pick a medium for social, go to Instagram and just follow the people that are inspirational to you. Sure. And use that as your starting point versus going to some of these other platforms and getting caught up in feeds that you're not necessarily following those people, but they're interjecting content into your life. Like YouTube does a good job at, at this is like, they'll say recommended videos. Well, you can get something thrown in front of you to derail you, maybe take you off course. So f go on Instagram, follow the people that you want. If you're going to do something, you don't sure. have to do any of that, but do that or listen to someone that is inspirational to you, whether that be this podcast or something else. And then you're going to be much better off than sitting there doom scrolling on the news. Yes. So, uh, so that's good to get started. One of the, one of the things, and I should back this up by saying the goal of this is to really ask you 10 questions that I find to be very common and very popular. So the second one is about immediate results. We live in an area or a time, I should say, of instant gratification. And uh, I was talking to Colleen the other day who helps manage this podcast and is my assistant. And she was saying that, you know, when she walks by like a slice of pizza, she wants that immediate gratification that she didn't pick up that pizza. And that's just not the reality of life, unfortunately. I wish it, I wish it was. How long does it take, though, for someone to start noticing results from either following a diet or uh, adopting a workout plan that may be new to them? Sure. So I like to couch this two ways. So one is there can be an immediate gratification component insofar as mindful eating, right? So let's say you overeat something. Let's say pizza, right? It's pretty easy to overeat. It's palatable. It tastes good. And if you just say to yourself after you eat, hey, how do I feel, right? And if you don't, if you notice, you know, my stomach's kind of full, my kids want to play, I can't really, I just don't feel up to it, that kind of thing. Starting to notice that makes a difference. So that's something in the very short term you can notice. And on the flip side, let's say you opt for, you know, a, a more nutrient dense meal, right? Maybe you have a nice piece of fish, some vegetables, what have you with it. And um, you notice that you feel better. You have more energy, you feel better. So right there, that's a pretty short term kind of feedback loop that you could tap into. In terms of like physiological changes outside of just that, that you know, that quick hit from the meal, um, you know, within 
a month, two months, you know, you could really start to see significant changes, but you have to measure them too. And this is important, right? So it could be the scale, which, you know, I will say in the short term, that can jump around quite a bit, you know, so I wouldn't make that your only source, but you can measure your waste, you could take pictures, things like that. So I would say a month or two, you could really start to notice a difference. And then there's some other underlying physiological changes that'll take place in response to what you're eating. So your gut microbiome can start to change in response to the food that you eat, which will then reshape your palate. Um, but often people stop right when these changes are starting to happen, right? Because they're, they're doing this thing where they're trying to will their way through things, um, you know, versus kind of marrying the two, right? The short-term feedback with, okay, now I see I'm making progress, right? And if you really just say, well, I'm already here 30 days from now, where will I be a year from now, you know? And probably in a really good place, right? Assuming you're following something. So I think that's a pretty good time frame. So you're saying, so short term is more psychological in how you're feeling after you eat something. I could attest to that as well. Like even, even though I've been on a health and wellness journey for a while, there's days like last week, last Friday, my wife and I are like, oh, let's order pizza. My brother's over, a bunch of kids around. Pizza's just a, a fun food. Like I love pizza. And all of a sudden, we get this extra large pizza, and I end up eating, like, almost half of it. And I felt horrible for two days afterwards, like, two days, like, literally. And I was like, why did I do that? It tasted so good, but I had these, these ramifications. So that's clearly something that is telling me, okay, just remember how you felt from eating that pizza. Now, in my case, I hadn't ate that much in a while, so I kind of... Even though I knew it, I kind of forgot it. Yeah. So, so sometimes it happens, but then I think the important part is getting back on track. But I want to get back to the physiological side of it. So when can you start seeing effects like either your gut reducing, your your hips getting smaller, or you getting a little bit more toned? How long sure. does that take? Sure, yeah. So I, I would say 60 days is a pretty reasonable amount of time to see something that we would consider significant, right? Now, the heavier you are, the more you're going to see in terms of like numbers on the scale, right? But let's say, you know, maybe you have 20 pounds to lose. You can't compare yourself to the person who maybe has 100 pounds to lose insofar as the actual, you know, the, the, the number, the percent change could be similar, but the actual number, right? It might be, oh, I lost three pounds, right? And I would encourage people to look at like what a pound of body fat looks like too. So they know that that's not insignificant. I mean, it's, it's a big blob, so to speak, right? And it's yellow and, it, you know, and people look at it, they always go, ooh, you know, and it's like, yeah, that, that's real. That's good. That's that much less your heart has to pump against. So I'd say that's a good um, a, a good amount of time to start to see it. Now, usually what I will say is these changes, people start to see it first, usually in their face. You know, you'll have a friend see and they'll start to notice up in the upper body. You are losing in your midsection. It's just, it's not as noticeable at first, right? And that can sometimes discourage people. So that's where I always encourage people to take a tape measure and measure your waist. Just run it over your belly button, measure it, write it down. I think that's a really good indicator because sometimes what happens, especially if you incorporate resistance training with a protein-rich diet, um, you may be able to build muscle while losing body fat, and that can make the scale kind of tricky because theoretically, if you lost, say, two pounds of body fat and you built a pound of muscle, you know, you're only going to see a, a, a one-pound change on the scale, but really it was more than that, right? You lost two, you, you built a pound of muscle, so there's like a four-pound body composition change that you're missing out on. So I'm smiling because the last time I was traveling, I, I showed my ID the TSA agent and... He's like, wow, Joseph, you lost a lot of weight. <laughs> yeah. And my wife is there and she's like, you just made his day. And it was, <laughs> it was awesome because sure. my, my picture was taken a while ago. But yeah, you're right. I mean, that's one of the first things you can see. And I also want to say that I know a lot of people are listening to this, but there's going to be a, a, a video version on YouTube and we'll actually show pictures and graphs. And on the website, we're also going to have a lot of, of extra stuff. We're going to have some... Uh, articles that are backing some of the things we're going to be talking about today. We're going to have some calculators and a bunch of other great stuff. So make sure you check the show notes on this podcast, wherever you're listening to it, to get the video version and to also see all the supplemental material. The visual matters. I totally agree with that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I remember the first time I lost like 20 pounds, I grabbed a 20 pound weight and I could not believe that, that I was carrying that around and I held it over my head and it was the most gratifying feeling. So that's another thing. Whatever you start to lose, if that's your goal, sure. 
take that weight in like a dumbbell and just hold it for a second and just think about what you accomplish because yeah. that's it's no easy feat to be able to to do something like that and then think about the impact of that reduction that's going to have on your joints your heart your entire body and how powerful that is and then look at the longevity that that is going to give you in your life i think all of that stuff kind of circled in my head as i as i held that weight over that's over awesome. my head that's great so um I think I, I just gave a good example about a cheat day. I had this big pizza and felt like crap after for a few days. But how do you feel about cheat days when someone is embarking on a journey like this? Sure. I don't like them because it, for a few reasons. Number one, it reinforces bad habits. You know, one of the processes that happens as you eat in an energy deficit is that your stomach will start to shrink and things like that. And you can kind of, you know, reverse some of those effects. But um, you know, more than anything too, it kind of reinforces this food reward kind of loop and stuff too. And the biggest factor, and we'll be able to, you know, show this graphically is it's probably the number one thing I see that people, um, struggle with where Monday through Friday, you know, most people work, they're very good. They're on point and maybe they're eating 30% less than they burn. Right. Um, so they're building up a deficit, right? Which means 30% of your energy is coming from body fat. You know, energy is neither created nor destroyed, only transferred. So if you're doing the work, a certain percentage is going to be coming from food and a certain percentage will come from body fat. And the only way to do that is through a deficit. So imagine you've accumulated, let's just call it a 3,500 calorie deficit Monday through Friday, which is roughly going to be about a pound of body fat. And then the weekend comes and you do the cheat day thing. It's not hard to eat into a 3,500 calorie deficit over the course of two days, even one day. Um, that is the number one thing I see. And I even make a chart, like I said, we can show demonstrating how to blow your deficit over the weekend because it's the most common thing. And that could be debilitating on your confidence because then you start to think, I'm cursed, I can't do it. And then you, you start to buy into these metabolism myths and stuff like that when really you blew it over the weekend. That's the truth. So to remedy that, instead of telling somebody, and this kind of goes back to that short-term immediate gratification, instead of me saying, okay, you got to stay with a 30% deficit through the weekend, that could be hard for most people. So maybe what I'll say is, hey, why don't we eat a little bit more over the weekend, right? Maybe you go into like maintenance where you eat an energy balance, where maybe you don't gain weight, but you also don't lose weight, right? And that allows you to maintain that deficit and you could start to see the results accumulate. And um, the other benefit to that too is that's more indicative of how you're gonna eat when you get to your goal. Because the thing people need to think people need to remember is you're not gonna be in a deficit the rest of your life. So let's say you're 200 pounds and your goal is to be 150 pounds. I tell people, you're eating for the 150 pound version of yourself. And if you do that, you eventually become that 150 pound version of yourself. That's good. And then once you get there, you eat to maintain that. You don't need to overeat, you don't need to undereat. And there's some other you know, physiological things that you know, we could dive into um, later that, that happen, but that's, that's kind of a way I like to think of it for people. So to reframe that a bit, just let's just say that every day I have a deficit. I'm supposed to eat, um, or my, that my energy ex expenditure is 2,300 calories. I'm, it's not. I'm just making sure. it up for easy math. And uh, in order to lose the weight I want, the calories that I should stick with are, let's say, 2,000. Again, no, this isn't for me. Sure. So every day I'm carrying this 300 calorie deficit. I'm carrying that Monday through Friday. So at the end of the week, Monday through Friday, I have carried 1,500, uh, a deficit of 1,500 calories. So then Friday or Saturday comes and I order that pizza and I have a beer. There's no way that's not 2,000 calories right there. Yeah. So I just burnt everything that I did during that week. And I think that is such a big problem because people feel the gratification of how good they did during the week and then they want to celebrate the win. And I know that's kind of unfair, but that to me is where I know for myself where I found I was falling down is the weekends. Sure. And physiologically, it's actually what your brain is driving you to do. So without getting too in the weeds, um, there's a part of the brain that in research is referred to as the lipostat and its job is for you to maintain your current body weight. We call it your biological set point because that part of our brain developed in a time when calories were not readily available. You couldn't go to the grocery store in the cave, right? Um, so to speak. So that part of your brain is defending your current body weight. We call it your biological set point. So it makes sense that you would naturally just gravitate toward energy balance, right? 
And, and the other trick of it can be too, when somebody's not losing weight is you're not overeating. Right. You're maintaining your weight. So technically, you're not being like gluttonous or anything. You're just maintaining your body weight. Yeah, at some point, you ate in a surplus to get to your new body weight. And usually, you know, the research shows people tend to do that over the holidays. And then they just spend the next year kind of maintaining it and kind of builds on itself. But the bottom line is that's kind of where it gets tricky. So that's where you have to, you know, pay attention and to, to be able to sustain that deficit. So I just wanted to make that point that it, it doesn't mean you lack discipline or willpower. It's actually your biology is kind of want you to be there. Now, a question I have is, going back to my example, now Sunday, can I just not eat and, and carry over that loss? Just say I'm feeling bad. I made horrible decisions yesterday. How does, how does that pan out? Yeah, great question. I mean, yes, but the question I would follow up with as, as a coach, right, I would say, is that sustainable? Do you really see yourself doing that in the long term? And, you know, for most people, the answer is no, right? So that's where I would say, well, let's, let's maybe try something else, right? So that's where I say, hey, why don't we build in some extra calories on the weekend, yep. not putting you in a surplus so that you, you can say the family does order pizza. We can make that happen. But then we get into more of the, hey, stop at 80% full, eat a salad first. We get more into um, you know, specific advice of how to handle that. And then maybe throughout the day, you eat light, you know, a lot of vegetables, you, know, you eat protein rich, that kind of thing to make sure you're full and you make better decisions, you know? Got it. Okay, so now when it comes to what you should be eating, I know a lot of people have a hard time with understanding labels. How do you recommend people get educated on that side of things? Yeah, that's that's the big question, right? Because there's so many there's so much conflicting information on on the web. There's a lot of fad diets out there and natural, and, organic, so vegan, much stuff. Plant-based, paleo, keto. You named it, right? All of them, right? And and people get really passionate about it if because if somebody's succeeding with something, you know, I see this and people get really tribal with it. And now oh, this is what it is and it and it Sometimes it fits my worldview or, you know, this or that. And the truth is the best diet is the one you can sustain, right, with, with regard to a deficit, right? Assuming it's nutrient dense and if you can sustain it, that's fine, you know. That's, so I'm pretty flexible when it comes to that. Um, you know, what I like to point out when it comes to the fad diets is that if somebody is succeeding, the cause of it is not the diet per se. The cause is the energy deficit, right? Assuming we define success as losing body fat. That's it. So what helps you sustain the deficit is, is going to be the number one thing. And you'll have friends that do it that are vegetarian. You'll have friends that do it that are paleo. Um, what I tend to find with these is that, generally speaking, of course, there's going to be exceptions. So, you know, I don't want anyone to bite my head off. But generally speaking, in the long term, I find a flexible approach is a little bit better. And where... The rules of thumb are, for me, I would say largely plant-based, lean proteins, right, um, are going to be a part of it. And roughly 80% of your energy intake from what we would call nutrient-dense sources, right, minimally processed for the most part, but there's some exceptions, like a can of beans is processed, but it's still, you know, good for you, right, and, and not something people overeat. And then 20% can be what you want, right? And, and I think when you start there, you've got a better shot in the long term. So when you think about alcohol consumption, going back to that example again that I gave with the pizza and the beer, how important is it to either reduce or eliminate, or do you have to eliminate wine or beer from your diet to get the effects that you want? Great question. So if somebody truly has an alcohol issue, of course, right, the, the elimination is probably going to be the answer, right, if you fall in that category. And that's just some honest self-assessment. Um, if you're somebody who you know, maybe you come home on Wednesday after work and you're cracking open a beer or a glass of wine. I always ask people to say to themselves, hey, is this worth it? You just want to ask yourself, Am I, do I really need this? I'm just kind of hanging out here. Um, because our relationship with alcohol, and, and, and a lot of this is just from experience working with people, is it's very casual. You know, we don't think of it in the context of, say, cigarette smoking. But when you go to the American Cancer Society, it's the same class carcinogen. You know, we just don't think of it that way, though. Yep. Um, so I, I would say, yes, you, you can have some alcohol, right? But I would try and limit it in so far as you can. So let's, if we're going to put a concrete number on it, I would say 20% or less of your calorie intake, no more than twice a week would be a pretty good way to base it, you know? And, and by the way, if you're somebody who doesn't see yourself doing it, it doesn't mean you can't start maybe at a higher point and kind of back it down. Because I have had people succeed who have still, and then over time, I just like to ask questions, you know, and people, you could do this yourself. You know, do I really need this? How do I feel? You know, I know you had an experience 
too with that, right? Where you actually saw the physiological effects. Yeah, I absolutely did. Um, this was a few months back and I'm also on another streak of about 60 days where I haven't had any alcohol. My issue isn't like I wake up and I need to have alcohol. It's when I start drinking, I'm a binge drinker. Like I, I will have not one IPA or two, I'll have four. And same with wine. And I just recognize that. I, and it's, I don't know, I wouldn't say the word embarrassing to admit, but I'm just in, I just know myself and have saw the pattern enough to know I can't just have one drink. So I just have been abstaining from alcohol consumption for the most part. Not to say it's going to be eliminated forever, but it's, it's been helping. And the most important thing for me, initially you start to feel like you have superpowers if you're drinking a lot and then you stop drinking. But then what happens is you start to get a much clearer head. You, st- you start to be more articulate. You start to do things that you forgot you could even do, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Sure. But you don't feel or you don't see necessarily like this dramatic like change in weight, let's say. But what happens is because you're not drinking, you're not having that hangover, and you can get up and do the things that you intended sure. to do. So that to me is the huge benefit of abstaining from alcohol in my case, or if you're the type that can have one or two drinks, like that's phenomenal. I'm jealous of you. Um, But yeah, there's just so many side benefits to this that I think people that are in a similar boat as me may want to think about abstaining from it for just like 30, 60 days and just see how they feel. Exactly, because you, you notice how good you feel when you wake up mm-hmm. because, you know, on a physiological level, you know, I'm not being hyperbolic. I mean, alcohol is, it's a poison, right? So your liver has to detoxify it. You know, I'm not, I'm not one to just throw out the term toxins, just to be clear, but that is truly what's happening. So we want to keep an eye on that. And you could see it in your heart rate. You could see it in different areas where your body has to do different stuff. So it makes sense that you feel a lot better. A power tip that I found is I'll get a good non-alcoholic beer and I'll use that to curb my craving because it's not like... I was going to beer to get drunk, but I would, once I had one again, I would have more, but it was the taste. I actually really enjoy the taste of like a hazy IPA. Sure. So there's really good non-alcoholic beer on the market today that I think can get you past that craving. Then after a while, you're going to, you're going to realize that a half of one or one will curb your craving. You don't need four of them. So, yeah, I think a big part with the, with the beer and having like a non-alcoholic beer that's like a craft beer and tastes good because that's such a big group is important because you could still be social, you know, whether it's, you know, around here in the summer where you're out with friends and everybody's hanging out outside or, you know, you want to go somewhere. That's, that's a really good option for people. And that's a good way to redirect something where maybe, you know, you don't go from beer to no beer because you enjoy it. You have this alternative as an option and you don't, you get to not wake up with a hangover or not feeling, you know, that feeling good thing that we've talked about before, right? Where it's not yes or no, it's a one to a 10. A one is I'm hungover or I have the flu and a 10 is I feel great. You know, you can still experience that eight, nine, 10 while being able to be social. So you don't have to give that up because I think for a lot of people that might be a a bridge too far where it's like, I have to have this social component kind of thing. And you can. Yeah, that that makes a ton of sense. So I know we talked a ton about diet and now alcohol consumption. When you think about diet and exercise or diet and nutrition versus exercise, how much focus should be on what? Good question. Um, Both are important, you know, that's spoiler alert, right? And um, some people struggle with one versus the other. You know, I see a lot of people, I'm really good about exercising, but I don't eat well. And I do see the inverse of that too, interestingly enough. I think they go together because what drives people to want to eat better is the fact that they worked out. You know, I'm a big proponent of resistance training. If somebody asks me, hey, should I do cardio or resistance training? I say, if if you can only do one or the other, I think resistance training is really important um, because of all the health benefits. You know, you can kind of build cardio into it by just moving faster between sets, that sort of thing. But you get all the benefits of, you know, better bone density building muscle, which helps your body composition and all of that too. So, um, what about though both. for your heart? Like I've just seen a benefit in my resting heart rate in my VO two max. And that wouldn't have came, that wouldn't have come from just weight training. I, I, I think cardio is really important. I was just saying more that you could, you can get that cardiovascular benefit in your resistance training if you just really pick up the pace and get it going. But I agree. Ideally 
it's both, right? It's a simple thing could be, hey, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you do 30 minutes of a simple full body workout. And then, you know, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, you know, you do some form of cardiovascular activity, whatever that is. It could be riding a bike. It could be going for a brisk walk. It could be jogging, any of those things. Yeah, there's huge benefits for that. So I am not kind of a one or the other. It's just one of those where sometimes people ask me, hey, if you can only, you know, whichever, I'd say, well, that would be it. But ideally both. I think they're both really important. What's the minimal viable amount of exercise that you need to get to see change and to combine this with a, a diet to get the results that you're, you're looking for? I think at least three days a week of at least that like 30 minute kind of threshold, you know, and I, and I think you really will start to be able to see the difference. And some of that too is the nature of your job too will kind of dictate that too. If you're sitting a lot and even outside of work, you're sitting a lot, I'm more would be better, right? Because if you think you're going to erase 40 hours of sitting with you know, three workouts, it's like, yeah, it's better than none at all, but you should be doing more. You know, if you have a dog, walk your dog, you know, really make activity non-negotiable. I'm a big, you know, objects in motion tend to stay in motion. So just make being active part of it. And there's a huge mental benefit to that too. I see that all the time with people, they feel better. You know, you started the podcast talking about watching the news and getting caught up in your thoughts. It's like, put on some music and go for a walk. You will feel so much better. And the other benefit you'll see, and if you notice this, is you'll be less stressed, you'll be the best version of yourself for your family, for your friends, all of that. Whereas if you're just sitting around, you know, that's where a lot of that anxiety starts to creep in and because you're never present. The beauty of exercise is sometimes your focus is on your next breath, not, right. you know, all the other stuff happening. So Yeah, I think if you're at work, I've said this ad nauseum, but take a walking meeting. Just go out, especially if you're leading a meeting, be the example, lead by example, tell your team, I'm calling into this. So it gives them permission to feel like they can call into it as well. If you tell people, oh yeah, make sure, you know, you guys can call into meetings, but you're never calling into a meeting that's not leading by example and someone's gonna feel guilty about not doing that. I'm a huge proponent. Today, I had three meetings in the morning, I took them from the car and guess what, I'm more present. I'm not in front of my computer that notifications flying all over, an email comes in from a client, I happen to see the preview, and now I'm, I get stuck in that. And it's just the way it is. So I think you, there's so many other ancillary benefits to walking and working. And one of the things I mentioned to you recently is this term nerd neck that I see myself developing where you, your neck all of a sudden, you, you know, the normal human like sits more upright or has a straighter neck. And then as you get more and more, and for those of you listening, I'm inching my neck a little bit forward, but as you get more and more into your computer, you don't even realize it, but all this, your posture is changing and it's kind of permanently changing and it can have, that can have downstream effects too. 100%. We see like the back, the neck issues, things like that. Now I'm adjusting myself subconsciously, but yeah, <laughs> it, it is, right? And a lot of people just from a training standpoint, they need to do some like upper body pulling and stuff, you know, and we'll put that on the page, just some sample you know, workouts where people can use that as a resource. Cause I think a big part of what we talked about, we wanted people to have simple actionable steps. So we'll include yeah. some exercises that are for people who sit a lot where we see, you know, a lot of atrophy in the upper traps and, you know, around the scaps and stuff. And then just by sitting back, it's like, oh, my shoulders and my neck don't hurt anymore. And that is something where it's a pretty small investment for a huge benefit on the other end of it, where that stuff doesn't hurt and bother you. Yeah, no, right on. And I need to I need to work on that. I was Googling a couple of weeks ago and then I told you about it, about the nerd neck. So I'm like, oh my God, I have this. Yeah. <laughs> Mo I think most people do, right? Even even yeah. people without desk jobs because so many people are craned over on their phones and stuff like that too. And uh, yeah, it's 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 fixable, which is, is the really good part about it. So let's switch topics. Uh, another popular question is how much sleep does my body need to be healthy? And one of the things I had, I had, uh, Alex Pangon, who talks about rest. I've had other guests on that that were either endurance uh, or behavioral science experts talk about the importance of sleep. And one of the things I did that just clicked with me is that it feels like when you should get eight hours of sleep, that six hours is fine. And it feels like seven hours is more than fine. If you think about that from a percentage standpoint, it's it's not fine. It's like... 80%, 70% of what you should be getting. So how important is sleep and how much body or how much sleep does your body really need? Sure. So this is a really, if you look at the data, it's pretty driven by individual difference sometimes. 
And we also have to consider your, your quality of sleep too plays a role in it. And now there's all these devices and stuff and, um, you know, some are better than others, you know, in so far as what they can indicate about the type of sleep you're getting, how restful it is. Um, but also your activity throughout the day. You know, I always give the example of the person who works all day, you know, maybe they have a desk job and they're, they're mentally fatigued, but physically they're not. And they go to sleep, but they never get that good restful sleep because they're lacking that physical component. Maybe these are people who have trouble falling asleep sometimes. So that can affect it too. We touched on alcohol. I mean, that's definitely going to affect the quality of your sleep. So that's an area where, hey, kind of questioning huge, those drinks, huge. right? Huge. Your resting heart rate will change by 20 beats a minute once you abstain from alcohol. It's crazy. Like, yeah. and, and you think about what that's doing over time to your body. If your resting heart rates, mine's at 50. I would say that if someone heard my resting heart rate was at 70, they'd be like, oh, that's pretty good, but not good for me. Sure. So... It is literally significantly higher on a daily basis, the times when I'm drinking. And over time, think about what that does to your body and the heart disease that it can create versus thinking about it the other way. And if you abstain from it and you get it back to a place where it's your normal, the benefit that it can have. Huge, right? You're... you're driving home the point that, you know, like your, your body has to do all this work to detoxify the alcohol to go back to that, right? So that's what's happening. You know, I like to use the analogy of starting your car, you know, leaving it in park and letting it idle. It's almost like your foot's on the gas a little bit, right? And that's going to sap your energy the next day too, right? Because one of the benefits of fat loss, just to bring this back to sleep, is smaller bodies burn less at rest, right? Your, your resting metabolic rate is not going to be as high when you're lighter. That's a big driver of that. And one of the biggest things I hear anecdotally from clients is I have so much more energy, right? And part of that is, you know, nutrient density, eating better, being active. But part of it too is just this idea that at rest, you're much more efficient, right? You know how like a lot of modern cars, you get to the stoplight and yep. the engine like stops. That's kind of how I like to think of it, almost like that. And energy is neither created nor destroyed, only transferred. So now that energy can be allocated elsewhere. So that actually plays a role too when it comes into sleep, um, and back to the individual difference, some people, like you referenced, six hours of sleep is more than enough for them, you know, and that there are people like that, and there are people who need eight hours. It really is driven by individual difference. A, a simple way to think of it is, you know, how do you feel, if you wake up in the morning and your first thought is, I need to go back to bed, you probably need more sleep. However, if after a couple minutes you're just up and you're good, you're probably okay, right? And as long as throughout the day you're not yawning and feeling exhausted, you know, that you're probably going to be fine. And again, too, this all ties back into, are you, are you working out? Are you eating well? Because the, you know, when people start working out and they start eating more nutrient-dense foods, they just feel better. They have more energy. They're like, well, I don't, I don't need that afternoon nap that I, or I started yawning at that point in the day. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't happen anymore. And uh, it's all these things tying together. So I can't accurately say it's 100% due to this or that. It's likely just the combination of everything. It's like this snowball effect of, in a good way of, of energy. Yeah, I've seen a big difference. So between six to eight hours, even though you don't think you're being affected, after a while, if you do change and increase your sleep from six to eight hours, you'll, you will see a difference. You, you definitely will. You might be able to operate fine on six, but even better on eight. Sure. So I would say that. And, it, and a trick to do is if you're going to work out in the morning, if you're going to get started on your day, which I'm a big proponent of, just figure out when you're going to wake up and back into that yeah. and trying to get seven to eight hours of sleep. And that's when you got to go to bed and turn it off, like shut off the Netflix, shut off uh, whatever you're watching. Um, what I've been doing with my son late, lately is doing meditation with him, a three minute headspace meditation. He is so wired at night and we sit down, I lay in his bed and it's magical. I turn on headspace. There's a headspace kids meditation. We turn it on for three minutes, three minutes. He's out that's completely great. and sometimes i'm out next to him and i end up waking up in sure. his bed because it's just that relaxing it's when you can shut your your brain off if you go from your day to your tv your brain doesn't get a chance to relax at all and then all of a sudden you're going to sleep at 11 you're going to sleep at at uh, midnight and if you're if you have a workout schedule that's in the morning you're either not going to be at your full self or you're going to be half-assed in it, or you're not going to wake up and do it. 
So highly recommend thinking about your day, plan in advance what you know in advance, back into that and try and get as much sleep as possible. Yeah, that's good sleep hygiene and then good consistency is going to always play a role totally. in that too. And, and generally too, if you have a higher activity level, you're probably going to really notice that too, right? That's going to yeah. play, a, play a big role in that too. So no, I, I agree 100%. So last time you were on the podcast, it was all about g getting ripped in your 40s and 40s was... Uh, was a number, was an age range, because we're both in our 40s, to focus on. But I think the, the theme of the podcast was you, you can get in shape at any age. And my question for you is, is there anything the audience should be aware of when it comes to age? Like, sure. what is it harder? Is it really harder? Like, just taking the science out of it. Someone who's 40 or 50 versus someone who's 20 or 30? Like, is it gonna be harder for us? Sure. So usually this is driven by your life situation. Usually when you're 40, you have more responsibilities, you have kids, you know, your, your job and your lifestyle is different. You know, the 20 year old just, oh, I gotta wake up at noon for my college class, right? That kind of thing. So from that standpoint, yeah, there's gonna be more where you probably have to plan better and you have less wiggle room to procrastinate, right? So I would argue that that can benefit you because you could just say, look, the gravity of my schedule dictates, I gotta get up at 5 a.m. to get this workout in or that sort of thing. So from an activity standpoint, yeah, you probably have to plan more, there's gonna be that part. Purely from the like metabolic rate, resting metabolic rate, age does not play nearly the factor people think it does. So one of the things when I work with people is I show them, hey, here's your resting metabolic rate. Let me show you what it was when you're 20. Let me show it to you when you're 70, what it looks like. And they're always surprised by how much of a difference it really doesn't make. And if you think about it, it makes sense. It's not like from when you were 20 to when you're 40, your heart hasn't stopped, your cells haven't stopped turning over, you know, apoptosis, things like that. It slows down just a little bit, not that much. And I always like to say age can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you say you're too old, you will be too old, right? That's just what's going to happen. Um, now, from an activity standpoint, maybe you have some attrition from injuries, right? Maybe you have an old football injury or something, or you hurt your knee any number of ways, and you can't do box jumps and sprints and stuff like that. Well, that's okay. There's other activities that you could do, right? Maybe you don't like to run, but you could ride your bike. You could do other stuff. So there's the resting metabolic rate side, which is, again, very minimal effect. And then the activity side is find something you enjoy and something that's largely pain-free. Now, some of that will become pain-free with weight loss too, right? Because every 10 pounds you lose is roughly 30 to 60 pounds of force off your joints with every step. So losing the weight will make you feel better. So sometimes if I have somebody who's you know, significantly overweight and they're like, oh, I want to go for, I want to jog or I want to go on the treadmill, I'll say, you know, maybe why don't we go with the bike or the rower until you lose more weight so that way you're not hurt, right? Because if you're not hurt, you're not moving. So that's how I like to break up the, the age thing from that standpoint, the, the lifestyle yeah. and then also the, the actual science. That makes a lot of sense. And I want to segue into body positivity now because there's a lot of, push on this or there's a lot of there's a lot a lot of posts that I'm seeing on just be comfortable the person that you are and I wholeheartedly believe that to a degree but what do you think about that if if someone is clearly overweight and they're not adopting a healthy lifestyle is that a slippery slope with promoting body positivity when at the same time you're you can be doing more to take care of your own health sure so like you said it's kind of nuanced right at the same time we don't want to put people down because of their weight and make them feel bad because if you're not confident you know you're not you're, you're not going to get the best version of yourself you're not going to trust yourself to do things so from that standpoint yeah the the positivity could be encouraging people like hey you're not too heavy to do this or that or try things but purely from a health standpoint it's not healthy we, it's not objectively it's not so telling somebody that it's healthy and encouraging it i don't think is good if you if you tr and you, and people generally you'll hear this and it's more of like in the ether it's not necessarily with um your loved ones, right? If you have a loved one and I asked you, hey, your, your friend, you know, who's 60 pounds overweight, if you snapped your fingers and you can make them not 60 pounds overweight, would you take that? And of course they would, right? If it's, if it's a mother or a father, uh, no doubt, right? So then that becomes, well, what are we talking about here, right? So I think that it's a fine line between encouraging that 
with also not mistreating somebody or discouraging them because they're heavy, you know? So, if, and a lot of people are nervous maybe to go to the gym or things like that because of um, these factors. So from that standpoint, great, right? If it gets you going and gets you doing there. But yeah, purely the health standpoint, it's, it's not healthy. We know it's not. You, you know, there's, there's the saying, right? You see, you see old people, but you don't see a lot of old, heavy people kind of thing, right? I, I might be butchering that, but it's more along those lines. We know that, and, and especially just going back to COVID, if you look at the tables, and we could post this, it's BMI and age. That's, those are the risk factors right there. So I wouldn't want to encourage somebody, especially in the current environment, to not do something about that. Yeah. And my father passed away when he was 56 years old, and it was diabetes. He had heart disease. Um, drugs and alcohol played a factor into it. But that's why I'm so passionate about this, because I want to be an example for my kids, not a detriment in the sense that they have to um, figure out where to bury me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, as morbid as that is, like that's the reality of, of some of this. And, and, and I do agree, like if you're born and you're just bigger boned or like it, celebrate that, like that, it, that's not what we're talking about. Here. Sure. We're not talking about something that you can't control or to make you not feel comfortable with who you are, celebrate who you are, but at the same time, be realistic with, your health. I'm talking about longevity here, not sure. necessarily the way you have to look. You don't have to look like an Instagram supermodel. It's not about sure. that. It's just about taking care of yourself so you can take care of a family if you want to, or just have a long life. The somatotypes, right? We call that like the body. Like there's the endomorph, the ectomorph, the mesomorph, or some combination of that, right? Like you mentioned, you can use sports as an example. Like I would never be a linebacker, <laughs> you know, I'm just, right. I don't have that body type, but that there's guys that are just bigger and, and girls too, right. That have different body types. And I think sometimes what happens with the body image issue is one body image gets replaced with another, right? Like I think in the nineties, it was just for women, it was just be as thin as a rail, you know, that sort of thing. And then there were women who would never be able to look like that. And now it's gone the other way where, you know, you just can't get your butt big enough apparently, or that kind of thing. And there are some females that are never going to achieve that. So really for me, it's just be the healthiest version of yourself where, you know, you're confident and you're healthy, right? That's, that's really what it is. Health. That's the number one thing. So I, that's a good point. It's not just don't, don't, don't be a something, be a someone, I guess, is, right. is the best way to put it, right? So there's two types of people, John. There's more than two, but <laughs> yeah, let's, gotcha. just, let's just summarize. Let's this. go binary. It makes life yeah. a lot easier. <laughs> so there's two types of people. There's the type of person that's going to listen to this. Let's call it three types, okay, okay. for this exercise. One's going to listen to this and say, you're full of shit, blah, blah, blah. Like, okay, get it. This isn't for you. Then there's another type to say, this makes a lot of sense, and I'm going to do something to start changing my behavior. I'm going to, I'm going to embark on a healthier lifestyle, and I'm going to start next week. And trust me, I was that next week person. My wife and I said it for years, like, we're going to start Monday. We're going to start Monday. Mm -hmm. Let's do whatever we want today. We're starting Monday. Yeah. And then there's the third person that is like, I, I need to do something. I want to go. So I'm going to focus on that person. What can that person do today? The hell yeah person. Sure, yeah. The yesterday you said today person, right? Like, all right, let's do it. Um, so one is, you know, like I said, step back, like make, get an assessment of what your barriers are, what stopped you in the past, right? All, all of those kind of factors that we had touched on before, right? Um, now, once you've done that, concrete steps we could do is, you know, one, after you've done that, I would recommend downloading an app like MyFitnessPal and start taking inventory of the actual food you're taking in. Don't try to be perfect, right? Start tracking, get an idea of um, exactly what you're eating. Like get to, you're going to learn, hi, wow, I didn't realize that was that energy, energy dense, you know? Um, and, and, you know, you could use your hands to estimate, you know, we'll, we'll put a guide up there too for portion sizes and stuff. So just don't try to be perfect, but start getting an idea of what you're actually taking in right there. Um, two, make daily activity, right? Just part of your, it's non-negotiable. You just have to do something. And we'll put examples up on the page, right? Whether that's just a simple body weight routine, or it could be as simple as a steps goal, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and, and then from there, you're, you're going to start to identify where your holes are. You might find that, hey, I do, I do really good at breakfast and lunch, but I just have a lot of trouble at dinner, right? Now we're starting to narrowly define your problems or your barriers, if you will. And that's when we could start to fix those, right? So I, I think those are really good places to start. And then, you know, and I, we did talk about those, right? The initial steps I talked about, right, with the social support and 
how that all matters, right? That's, th those are the first steps, but these are more the concrete ones where we can really dive into the actual nutrition. Yeah, I have to touch on a few things here. So weak points, identify your weak points. For me, I could wake up and be in a fasted state until lunch. I, don't, I have no desire to eat and I wake up in the morning. Um, I typically have a protein shake because I know that's important for me personally to build muscle. Lunch, I get hungry around lunchtime, then I'll snack a little bit, but my pain point is post-dinner. It's when my day is done, it's like seven o'clock at night, and whatever is around, I'll eat. <laughs> so my, my trick is, I don't, I do not like it around, because I don't have the will in some cases, and I know that about myself, just mm -hmm. like I was talking about knowing that I'll binge drink, so you have to be honest with yourself and say, like, if cookies are here, I'm going to go find them. If For me, it's Twizzlers. If Twizzlers are in the house, I'm going to go find them, and I'm going to eat more than I should. So finding that, that weak point is, is huge. The other thing that you touched on is my fitness pal. And I know what people are going to say. I hate to track this. It's a pain in the ass. It takes two minutes after every meal, two minutes. You don't have to do it forever either, especially if you develop – a pattern of eating. For example, I know that my protein shake that I have post-workout is about 450 calories. I know the macro um, nutrients in that. I know the percentage of protein, the carbs, the fat. And I know that that's a pretty standard in my diet. I don't need to put that in there every single week or every single day. My lunch, I like easy. So I use trifecta. It's a meal service. I get that delivered to my house. I heat that up in a steamer. I eat that. That's about 500 calories. I know the macronutrients in that. It, they don't vary a ton. And then dinner is the variable. But if you stick to some basics like um, having a protein or if you're plant-based, having more protein and you're around the same, then you don't have to track it forever. It's when you're varied, when you're going out to eat. I, we took the kids bowling last week, went to this place, and literally nothing on the menu except a garden salad, which just lettuce and dressing was, that was like 300 calories. Everything else, I shit you not, was like 1,500 plus. A sure. burger plus fries, 2,000 calories. I'm like, I can't, I don't want to eat any of this because I know I'm going to eat it if I order it. And that kind of sucks because you're, you're, you know, in your head, you're just like, man, I can't eat anything here. I'm glad they labeled it because I would have ordered it and I sure. wouldn't have thought anything different. Yeah, the three questions to always ask yourself. This is a good heuristic I tell people. Where's my protein source? Where's my vegetable? Do I have room for a carbohydrate source? And the way you can answer those questions is like you mentioned tracking. It's very revealing, I guess, is the point. And the evidence demonstrates, and, and also my experience, when people track, they do better. And you learn. Like people, A lot of people don't have an idea what some, when something's protein rich. They don't know how much fat comes with that protein source or things like that. So you're just taking inventory of how much is actually coming into the system so you can truly learn, right? And, and say, well, why do people just turn to a fad diet? Because it simplifies it. You know, if you tell somebody, okay, you can't have carbohydrates. I mean, basically what you're doing is the you're tricking them into a protein-rich diet where it's harder to overeat protein, so you end up in a deficit, and you get to a certain point, and then you plateau, and then you say, wait, this isn't working anymore, right? And, you know, a guru will tell you, well, you just got to try harder, or, you know, some kind of non-starter advice, right? When really what it is is you just don't know how much you're actually taking in because you just kind of followed this diet where you had some unnecessary food avoidance, because let's be honest, apples, oatmeal, and bananas were not your problem, right? But yep. you eliminated them. Just, and I'm not picking on low carb because sometimes people can't succeed with it. But generally speaking, when we look at the long-term studies, nobody's really sticking to it in the long term because it's unnecessary food avoidance, right? Um, so where's my protein? Where's my vegetable? Do I have room for carbohydrate source? Um, you know, you could set many goals too. Like hey, I'm going to have at least two servings of vegetables each day, things like that. And you could put little notes in my fitness pal, things like that. But like you mentioned, this becomes a skill where you spend less and less of your time during the day doing it. And the reality is we live in a food environment we're not made for, right? There's, there's, there's food reward all around us. And what tracking does is it allows us to leverage technology to help us, right? We use technology in a lot of areas to make our life easier. Why is this any different, right? That's, that's the way I like to think of it. So I think that can really help people a lot. Um, and you mentioned if you're eating out, maybe look at the menu in advance and, oh, this, I'm at this mom and pop place. They don't have chicken parm here in my fitness pal. Okay, use like a place like Maggiano's where they have their recipe, their whole menus online. That's going to be close. You don't have to be perfect. You're getting an idea of it. 
And then on top of that, you just do some of the behavioral things where you know when you've overeaten or you know to you say to yourself, hey, I know I can eat more. Let me stop, say, 20% short of full. Wait 10 minutes and see how I feel. And usually you'll feel fine. So those are some of the behavioral components you can kind of work into it as well, too. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And I would say that um, for the people listening, we're going to do a video of how to use my fitness pal separate from this podcast because sure. I think it's really important to figure out your macros, what you should be eating. And generally, this is a general, but like what, what would those macros be? How much protein as a percentage, how much fat and how many carbs? Because that's one of the things you input in MyFitnessPal. Sure. Yeah. So the, the grams per pound is like a big one. Um, you know, usually lean body mass weight is a better guide than like one gram per pound of body Not weight. Grams, you know? but like percentage. Got it. So, well, the percentage is also going to vary too, just un unfortunately based upon the person's activity level. So I, I try not to use percentages and I try to start with here. I'll keep it simple. I say, Hey, if, if it, let's just say, you know, your body fat is roughly 25%. Okay. 0.75 times your weight will tell you what your lean body mass is, right? Just, okay, there's that is. And you could set your protein anywhere from like 0.7 to one gram per pound of lean body mass. Boom, there's your protein. Fat, somewhere between 0.3 to 0.4 grams of your goal body weight I like to use, right? So if I'm 200 pounds, my goal is 150, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 times that, there's your fat. And then we can calculate the calories very easily. We'll, we'll, we'll create a um, table, right, to make it easy for people. And then the rest can go over to carbohydrates. Simple as that. So do your protein, do your fat, and then whatever you have left over can go to carbohydrates. Gotcha. So what we'll do is on Anonymous There, we'll create a page, anonymousthere.com forward slash challenge, because I want to challenge who's ever listening sure. to this into a 30-day... Uh, I don't want to call it an experiment, but I want to call it a 30 day jump start. Like we know we're not going to accomplish everything in 30 days, but what you're going to do in 30 days is build momentum. So not almost there.com forward, forward slash challenge. You're going to go there. We're going to walk you through the steps of how to calculate macros, how to enter them in my fitness pal. We'll show a video on how to make that happen. And then that will give you a baseline of diet. And I can tell you what's great about this is if you don't even work out, and I hate to say this, just by you following your diet, you're going to see results, which really what I'm telling you is if you do nothing except take away food from what you're putting in your body, you're going to see results. I highly encourage you to do the next steps, which are going to be to work out. So we talked about the minimal viable workout. Let's recap that quick. We're looking at three times a week, four times a week, what should we have people do for this challenge? Sure, I think three 30 minute full body workouts and then the days in between some kind of like active recovery Walk type cardio. Walking, bike, biking, running. And for how long? 30 minutes. Okay. 30 minutes, I think so it's a pretty small day, commitment. So we, we need you moving for 30 minutes. Yeah. Okay, all right. And, and you'll it, feel good, that's for sure. You will, okay. you will not regret it, right? Yeah. You're not like, oh, I shouldn't have done that bike ride. Like things so, people don't say, right? Yeah. So, so basically they're gonna, they're going to follow a diet that is, uh, I hate to even use the word diet. They're going to follow an eating plan that isn't going to be restrictive. Yep. It's just going to be based on tracking. And you don't even have to track the whole entire time, but I would highly encourage you to track for the first week or to at least track to know that the math of the, um, the energy balance is in a spot that is going to yield the results that we're all looking for. Everyone is subject to an energy deficit. If you think you're cursed by your metabolism, you are not. Right. There's a lot of myths out there. This, it's the same as gravity. It's just people understand gravity a little bit better. If you jump off the 10th floor of a building, it does not end well. And you say energy no, deficit, but what you're really saying is like calories in and calories out. Yeah, basically, right? And there's nuance there. And I always like to say that because there's going to be people out there all over YouTube telling you that it doesn't matter, follow my fad, whatever. If you are losing weight, it is an energy deficit. It's, it's right. everyone is subject to the laws of thermodynamics, just like gravity. That's just the reality. Work requires energy. What proportion of the work you do comes from your food? What proportion is going to come from body fat? If there's not enough food coming into the system to provide to uh, energy for your activity, your body will tap into your reserves, i.e. body fat, and force it in your bloodstream to be used for energy, and you will lose it. And everyone is subject to it. And if people tell me they're not, I always use the extreme example. I say, what would happen if you didn't eat for a month? They'd say, oh, I'd lose weight. Okay, so clearly it matters, you know? <laughs> I mean, that's an extreme example, but it's just to make the point, and I, and I say that not to be a jerk. I say it because I'm telling you that you can do it. You are not cursed. If you're doing this thing that, oh, it's my metabolism. If you're heavier, you burn more calories than your leaner friends. 
That's how it works. Bigger bodies require more energy. That's part of the health benefit of getting leaner. Your heart is pumping against less resistance, hence it takes less energy. So there's an efficiency component. And I just want to add too on that page, you know, we'll have the macros and we'll put a few tips here like, hey, 80% nutrient dense. And here's some examples of nutrient dense right. foods that you can kind of pick from. We'll put a little table there so you can kind of have it yeah. there. We'll add a bunch of resources. Um, so we have the, the diet, the workout. I, I think getting at least seven hours of sleep is going to be key. Because if you're doing all this and you're sleeping three hours a night, I don't think you're going to have the optimal sure. benefits either. No, no way. And then what, what about abstaining from alcohol or reducing alcohol consumption? For me, what I would like to say is if you're a binge drinker like I am, abstain for 30 days. And the good news is we're going to be in sober October soon, so maybe you can carry that through. If you're not and you want to have a glass of wine a couple times a week or beer, what do you think about that? Yeah, if you can do that, just be honest with yourself. If you're one of these people that you, know, you think cold turkey is really going to benefit you, do it. I would also add have a friend do it with you. Have, have that um, social support. I think that's important. You know, you can have that. Uh, extrinsic accountability is completely fine, especially when you're starting. Something could start with extrinsic, like, oh, I've got to meet my friend at the gym, so therefore I don't want to let them down. Eventually, we want that to become intrinsic, and it will, right? Just like your food choices, right? As you eat more nutrient-dense foods, your gut microbiome changes, your palate starts to change, and those start to become the foods that you crave. And it's not coming down to this willpower thing where I can't, I shouldn't eat that. And no, it becomes, I don't want that. That's when the true change happens. But you got to, at first, you know, maybe just adopt some of the extrinsic motivation type factors to get there. Got it. Are we missing anything from the challenge? No, I, I really think those are the biggest uh, recipes to success. I, I'd say maybe add one more is have tolerance for failure. You know, having the opportunity to work with a lot of people. You know, people who work with me, it's a little bit of a self-selecting sample, right? They want to they wanna change. So I, I would be lying if I didn't say that's certainly part of it. But I get people from all walks of life who maybe haven't worked out at all to, to professional athletes. And the biggest thing, whether you're a pro athlete or you're a regular person, is you have to tolerate failure and have a short memory. Whereas if you let it defeat you and you just say, oh, I did that, might as well just let the whole thing go, it's going to be difficult, right? You just got to give yourself a little bit of grace and treat yourself well enough to say, hey, I'm going to learn from this. Use failure as an opportunity to learn. We hear that time and time again. It's true of, you know, great athletes. And you've had, they, they take failures and it's, you know, that's what's going to drive them. And the person who doesn't, it lets, it lets it defeat them. And it's as simple as that for this. Yeah, Jordan Burroughs, who was on a few weeks ago and was at our Go event, was a great example of that. Yes. He said it really started to make a big difference when he started failing in public. So I think that that's another thing. Like, I would push out, uh, if you're on social media, if not, don't get on social media for this, but what you're doing. Like, you're going to encourage other people and you're going to be an example. One of the things that just hit me like a ton of bricks a couple months ago so when someone told me, or I read this, I, I don't even know how it came to me, but you can't ever make someone change, but you can lead by example. And I would say, look at yourself and look at your family or your friends and be that example and don't be an example of what not to do. And to your point, like if you fail or you eat that pizza like I did, I didn't sit there and make myself feel bad about it for the next week and just said, oh, I lost my momentum even though it was hard, I felt like crap. I realized it. I was like, man, I'm not going to eat pizza for a while. And I'll probably eat pizza again. I guarantee I sure. will. But I'm probably going to re reduce it. And even if I don't, even if I do what I did, I'll end up in the same boat and I know it. And and we're going to have that. And we're I do all that. Human. I had yeah. that happen recently. I'm like, why did I do that? I know, but I spend my days telling yeah. people that's normal. It's okay. It's okay to fail. And look, like the quote says, what is it? On the other side of fear is everything you ever wanted, right? Don't fear change. Don't fear trying, you know, don't, you got one life to live, you know, get after it, give it a shot, be willing to fail and be okay with it. Right. And just like you said, like Jordan said, that's what is competition at the end of the, it's social right. comparison. You're putting yeah. yourself out there for other people, not putting yourself out there at all. Come on. So it's okay to, it's okay to, to do that. So I think that's really important. And I'll say as a bonus, one thing that's really helped me is putting a date on a calendar for a race or an, yes. uh, something that is a bigger goal. Because what that does is it gives purpose to your day, right? If, I'm, if I miss a workout, it's like, all right, I missed a workout. If I'm training and a race that I'm going to is coming up in three weeks, every day counts, every day. So there is no, there is no zero days. If you're not, if I didn't have that, I'd give myself more leeway.
Deadlines get rid of procrastination. I like that. And that's <laughs> just the reality. It's true. Set them. Um, signing up for a race is a great point. I tell people all the time, find something, even if it's a year from now. Right. Do it in a tropical place or something where you want to, I don't I mean, something like that to drive you and tell a friend. I mean, do that stuff. I'm, it's so mad. And you can do it. Yes, you can. And if somebody around you is telling you you can't, maybe you want to reassess that relationship too, oh, right? Man. Yeah, when I was, uh, I, when I did the Chicago Marathon for the first time, what I was pleasantly surprised on is, is, you know, that five hours and change, I looked behind me and there's literally like 10,000 people walking. There, there is not this, uh, I know it's easy to think that there's something more out there, like, oh, all these, there's all these elite people at these races. There is not. There's every walk of life. The difference is they're there and they're showing up. And even if you have to walk through it, you did it. Yep. So just do it. And that will bring you confidence. Self-efficacy is kind of the fancy way we call it in research, right? And you mentioned an example. You know, look for somebody who you see yourself putting yourself in their shoes that has succeeded, right? Maybe you can't relate to you or me, but maybe there's somebody else who's like fits your archetype and they've succeeded. That's that's a great source of confidence. But your greatest source of confidence is going to be experience where you go out and you try something and maybe you fail but maybe you don't, but at least you tried, and that will start to build your, your confidence. So that's a really important thing. And I, now that we're doing this, just say one more quick thing is don't negotiate with yourself. You'll lose every time. Your brain knows what buttons to push to get you to not do stuff. Don't do it. Make it non-negotiable. Yeah. That's my term. It's non-negotiable. You said you're going to do that exercise. Damn it, you're going to do it. Otherwise, you're going to deal with that voice in your head at night, and that should yeah. drive you crazy. I always say there's always a reason not to do something. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Don't in even go there. Everything in life, there's always a reason. Yep. It's so true. Um, John, thank you for your time. Appreciate I, it. The uh, website for the challenge is going to be anonymousthere.com forward slash challenge, but I want to make sure people know how to get a hold of you because you're, you're way more of an expert in this arena than I am. Yeah, so I'm, I'm at nutrition361.com. Uh, you know, I have a consultation form. I you know, do consultations with people just to tear them out on their goals and things like that. Um, you know, if you just have questions for me, there's a contact form. You can get me there. I'm, I'm on social media. I'm not the best at it, just to be honest, uh, in so far as I'm posting and stuff. But I will answer questions if people have them. I truly enjoy helping people. If it's on the YouTube of this and you want to ask questions, I'll do my best to get on there and answer them and stuff like that too. So What we'll do as well is create, if there's the demand, create um, a social group either on Facebook or Instagram, however we want to do it. I'll publish it in the show notes, whichever direction we sure. head in. And then we could have a live, a live private kind of group session where you just do a Q&A. That'd be great, sure. Yeah. And ask the questions. I'm sure somebody else is thinking it too. It's like when you were a kid, right. somebody else has that question too. And I would sometimes not want to be the kid that asked and somebody else, I'm like, oh, glad they asked. Ask the question. It's okay. Yeah. I, the, you know, that, that's totally fine. Thanks again for your time today, John. Thank you. Appreciate it.